Hello guys, let's talk about phase changes. You already are familiar with these processes. This is basically the change from one state to another without changing the chemical composition of a compound. So let's say we have water, it can be ice, it can be liquid water or water vapor, right? During these phase changes, we can either add energy or release energy. When energy is added, we are going to have an endothermic process when energy is released from the system, we are going to have an exothermic process. So let's take a look at the phase changes. Let's start with melting and freezing. So when we go from a solid to a liquid state, we are going to have melting. And if you remember, in a solid, molecules are really close to each other and they are kind of vibrating in one place. In a liquid, molecules can pass each other, right? So this means that we need to add energy so the molecules can gain this mobility to pass each other. So melting is going to be an endothermic process when energy is needed to be added. What happens during freezing? Well, during freezing, we are going to actually release energy, which is going to be an exothermic process because from the passing state, molecules pass each other. They are just going to be stopped in one spot and kind of vibrate, okay? So this is going to be freezing and energy is going to be released in this case. Okay, now what happens when we go from a liquid to a gaseous state? We are going to have vaporization, right? Liquid to a gaseous state. As I said, in liquid, we are passing each other with the molecules in the gas. Molecules are just zooming, zooming around. So we need to add energy to get to the gaseous phase. So vaporization is going to be an endothermic process. Now, what happens when we have condensation? In that case, we are going from a gaseous to the liquid phase, and because molecules are going to be closer to each other, we are going to have an exothermic process when energy is actually released. Now, we also have to talk about sublimation and deposition. So the process of subliming is simply going from the solid to the gaseous phase right away. So this is why, for example, dry ice is called dry ice. Solid carbon dioxide is dry ice. You will never see it in a liquid phase at a 1 atm pressure because at atmospheric pressure it simply sublimes goes from the solid to the gaseous phase. That's from where the name is coming from dry ice because you will never see the liquid. Okay, now if we have to go from a solid to a gas whose phase or molecules are zooming around, do you need to add energy or will you release energy? Well, in that case, we need to add energy, right? So sublimation is going to be an endothermic process. And then when we are depositing, so going from the gaseous phase, back to the solid phase, we are going to release energy. So this is going to be an exothermic process. Okay, I hope this makes sense. Let's talk a little bit more about the energy changes. So when we are actually going from a solid to a liquid phase, at the melting point, we are going to call the energy change associated with this process the heat of fusion, delta H fusion. And when we are going from the liquid to the gaseous phase, at the boiling point, we are going to call the energy required for this change the heat of vaporization. And we are going to have the heat of sublimation, which is simply the energy required to change from a solid directly into the gaseous phase. Okay, so we know that we need to add energy to go from a solid to a liquid, from a liquid to a gas state, or from a solid to the gaseous state right away. Now, let's talk more about this using the example of a heating curve. The heating curve is simply the temperature plotted as a function of heat added to a substance. So let me draw this to you. Here, I'm going to have the temperature, let's say in degrees Celsius, and here 
here I'm going to have the heat added. Heat added. Now, if I start, let's say here, let's say this is minus 25 degrees of Celsius. As I add heat to water, for example, then my temperature will rise. And the temperature will rise up to the melting point. At what temperature does water melt at 1 atm pressure? At zero degrees Celsius, right? So I can achieve zero degrees Celsius here. And now I'm going to have the process of melting. So notice that when I'm melting, actually the temperature of the substance does not rise. Okay, so during a phase change, the temperature of a substance is always going to be constant because the energy is used to actually separate the molecules from a solid phase to a liquid phase. Okay, so the energy is used for the phase change. Now, once I changed all my solid into a liquid, so I melted all of it, then I can increase again the temperature and I can do it up to 100 degrees Celsius at which temperature my liquid is going to start boiling if it's water, right? So here I'm going to have boiling and once all my water boiled away, changed into a vapor phase, I can add more heat and the temperature will still rise. So let's take a look at different parts. So let's call this part A to B, C, D, E, and F. When I'm going from A to B, I'm simply increasing the temperature from minus 25 degrees Celsius to zero Celsius, okay? So here I'm going to have a solid or ice if I am talking about water. And the amount of heat added to raise the temperature of a substance is going to be given by the product of the specific heat multiplied by the mass and the temperature change, so the delta T. And just a reminder that the specific heat is the amount of heat per unit of mass required to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius or Kelvin. Okay, so this is how I can calculate how much heat do I need to add to actually increase the temperature of a solid or in this case ice. Now what happens when I am in the part where I have B to C? So you can see that from B to C the temperature doesn't change. Here I have zero degrees Celsius and this is the process which is called melting. So during this process, I can calculate the temperature added using the heat of fusion, okay? So delta H fusion. This is usually given by energy per mole. So let's say that the heat of fusion of water is, I'm just giving you a number, 10 kilojoules per mole, then if I need to melt, one mole of water, I need to add 10 kilojoules of energy. If I need to melt two moles of water, then I need to add 20 kilojoules of energy because two times 10 kilojoule per mole. I hope this makes sense. Then what happens when I go from point C to D? In this case, I'm going to have a liquid, right? Let's say liquid water. And again, I can calculate the amount of heat added if I know the specific heat, the mass, and the temperature change, right? Now, also notice that this line here has a smaller slope than this line here. This simply means that I need to add more heat to change the temperature of water uh, compared to the temperature of solid ice, meaning that the specific heat of liquid water is actually higher. So I need to put in more energy to increase the temperature of liquid water. Now, when I get to 100 degrees Celsius, right, here, my temperature is constant. This means that I have a process called vaporization. Vaporization. 
In this case, I can calculate the energy change using the heat of vaporization. Hopefully, you guessed it right. So, delta H VAP. And then once I vaporized all my liquid, then I'm going to have the gas or the vapor phase, and I can increase its temperature as I add more and more heat to it. So here, in this case, I'm going to have vapor or a gas. All right, I hope this makes sense. See you in the next video.